there. This is the Crime Cafe, your podcasting source of great crime, suspense, and thriller writing. I'm your host, Debbie Mack. Before I introduce our guest, I'd like to mention that you can buy anthologies of long and short crime fiction created by authors who have previously appeared on the Crime Cafe. Um, the Crime Cafe nine book set and the Crime Cafe short story anthology are both for sale on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Kobo, and Apple, along with other online retailers. Having said that, it's my great pleasure to have one of my favorite author friends on as a guest, Simon Wood. Simon, it's wonderful to have you here. Thanks for coming on. No problem. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Um, I have to say that I've known Simon for several years, and he was one of the first authors to give me an endorsement on one of my books. So for that, I want to thank you deeply again, Simon. That was so nice of you. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely loved your last book, The One That Got Away. And congrats on your movie option on that, by the way. Yeah, it's been going on for a little bit. I know they've uh it's at the screenwriting stage and I think next year we'll really see whether they can go all the way with the film or uh they'll uh you know cut their losses and, and move on to something else. But I'm you know, I'm quite excited. I think this has, stands a fairly decent chance of of making it all the way to the uh to the theatres. Um they've got a good track record. Well, that's absolutely fantastic because it's such a process to put a movie together and uh, it does take years. And just having that option is wonderful. Yeah, it's 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 one of those things I've had other author friends who've had, you know, you know, other options go to the point of um, making you know, they've gone to actually being in production, then being cancelled halfway through. I went to a film premiere once that uh, there was a film that was made local to where I was living. And that was the only time it was ever shown. It never got distribution. So it never uh, went anywhere. And that has got to be heartbreaking that you've actually made the film and it will never be seen by anybody. Well, you know, these days with the internet and streaming services, the chances are much greater of getting distribution. Oh yeah, I mean it's interesting. I think the most eye-opening thing to me was the the contract mm -hmm. for for the option because there are so many uh, what ifs and and you know other sort of things that spiral off. Not unlike a book contract, but it's fairly sort of like you know there's this this and this that could happen. You know oh, the yeah. film option was way wider than I'd seen before on you know. Mm the possible uh, connotations of how this thing could go. Hmm. Well, yeah, it's a terrible disappointment when things don't go through, but um, <laughs> it's just one of those things that happens. It's uh, the business, as they say. Um, I saw in your blog post where you talked about the inspiration for the one that got away, that it was inspired to a great deal by the concept of survivor guilt. And yeah, I thought your analysis in that blog post was very interesting, as interesting as the fiction that you created from it. Um, can you talk about why you picked that subject? Um, it was a subject I thought I knew a little about um, just from reading some certain things. And it turned out to be like something I ended up knowing nothing about in, in actual fact. But it was just the idea... Uh, I suppose it's that um, paradox of being guilty for surviving something terrible. And that appeals to me is that, you know, everything in fiction requires conflict. And that's just a perfect sort of um, medium for that is the idea of survivor guilt. And, um, and so I actually was having my head examined at the time. I had had a, had a concussion and because I have a history of concussions, I ended up spending a couple of days um, having my cognitive powers or whatever you'd like to call it, uh, analyzed. And I'd had the, the idea for this, for the one that got away. And I actually uh, asked the psychologist at the end and said, you know, I want to learn about survivor guilt. Uh, 
what do I do? And she sent me to uh, the Veterans Administration and I went to a VA hospital and I met with um, a psychologist who dealt with soldiers uh, uh, and vets dating back to Korea and all the way up to Afghanistan and Iraq. And we ju he just talked about the different things of, you know, how survivor guilt works or how what we now call PTSD works. Um, and it was fascinating because it gave you the conflicts, it gave you the paradoxes that you want to create in a character and in a plot line. And uh, a lot of it came from just that. But a lot, a lot of the books are born that I tend to write are born from an idea, you know, a situation or a scenario. And it's like, what can I build around this unusual, uncomfortable, uh, obscure kind of situation that we, you know, that we kind of see, but we kind of walk by most of the time. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like uh, most people don't understand what PTSD and survivor guilt is really like? I it, it it was it was interesting for me because I kind of had this sort of um, image in my head, and I think a lot of people will get it confused with depression more than anything. But it was kind of the situation of uh, the idea that you that there was there was this sort of they said this part of its fanciful thinking and an arrogant kind of thinking of like you'll never understand it because you were never there mm -hmm. but there's also a sort of fanciful kind of thinking in that if i i have the power to have changed what happened and that's why i feel bad mm -hmm. is that you know i was the one who could have changed everything and it's almost like god like thought of like you know i know this thing went tragically wrong and i know i was the only one who walked away but i was the one who had the power to change that and put it put it all right and so it's my fault because i'm the person who let everything down and it's kind of a weird there's a whole group of sort of thinking different kinds of thinking and the other one is is the reason you kind of see a destructive kind of behavior that goes along with it sort of like is stems from the idea of one, you want to put yourself back in that scenario. So if there was a certain set of circumstances, you want to uh, either recreate it or put yourself back in similar situations so that you can almost lose. This time you'll lose. You should have lost the first time. Mm -hmm. And so there's a thing of like, you know, so that's why you you see people either, um, you know, turn to, there was sort of like, the, you know, part of the symptoms are, uh, you know, drink and drug abuse, but also impulsive behavior, that thing of just flying off the handle or throwing yourself into situations that you wouldn't necessarily do. So there's a certain amount of recklessness that is built into, which I kind of built into Zoe's character is that once I kind of got that as a, as you know, part of the psyche of that, then I put that into her character that she's um, a hazard to herself She's not someone that is going to act rationally a bunch of times. You mm -hmm. know, she is going to, because one of part of it is she wants to find out who abducted her, but at the same time, she wants to lose to the person who abducted her. And so there's this, always this push pull kind of, I want to win. I want to lose. Um, I want to be better. I want to be worse. And so, it, you know, I can understand why that is such a difficult thing for, you know, friends and family and loved ones to deal with someone like that but it you know i think everybody kind of tends to think oh ptsd that's just depression and it's not it's a whole is a whole very complex mechanism that's that very, um it's hard to understand it is very interesting um wow uh your latest book, Deceptive Practices, deals with an entirely different topic. Can you tell us about that story? Um, yeah, I'm dyslexic and I misread the TV guide. Uh -huh. And I thought that I, was, I turned on a TV movie that I thought was about a shadowy company that um, roughed up uh, cheating spouses. And it was absolutely nothing to do with that. 
Yeah, I um, saw that. Yeah. And then I sort of went, oh, that's a real bummer. And then I thought, hey, you know what would be a good idea for a book? Would be a company that promises to um, beat up spouses for you if you if you catch them cheating. So um, I came up with a, an advertising pitch for these people. So the company's called Infidelity Limited, and their pitch is, uh, do you have a cheating spouse? Has counseling failed? Want to get even? Then hire uh, Infidelity Limited and then knock some sense <laughs> into that person. And uh, But that's, for me, I have to add a certain amount of complication. So this very seductive pitch about a sort of like dark web company that deals with cheating spouses, bad business partners and things like that um, isn't what you think it is. And so in this story, a woman called um, Olivia Shaw hires them after it's recommended to her by her sister and she hires them and they say, yeah, we'll just, we'll just give your husband a kick in, give him a choice, either straighten up or leave. But that's what we do. And it, and then uh, two weeks later, he's found dead. And then everything is starting to be turned onto her as the prime suspect. And the only thing that she can do is, um, is bring this company down because then they tell her what their real uh, company business is, is after her husband's dead and that she's been hooked into something much larger, much darker. Mm. Well, that's quite a concept. A lot of your uh, fiction seems to be very dark based on the, the dark side of human nature. Um, I'm thinking about uh, Terminated. When I read that, it was like, whoa. Now there's a what if situation that really got out of hand. Um, that was about workplace violence. And I noticed that you had written on a, on a blog post explaining about that, that you actually experienced some very, um, intense workplace violence yeah it, it was one of those things that had cropped up it'd come from my wife's old job uh -huh. um, she'd got a promotion and and so she basically got handed the if you like the new employees and then they said oh by the way there's this violent threat that one of the employees you're taking over has made to another and this is a um, just let you know there's a private company that's investigating him off site and is keeping an eye on him to make sure whether this is founded or not and we're just going to see if there's anything that we can find and um, and once we know one way or the other way we're going to fire him probably it's more than likely and when so I, I when i heard about this i said oh this is this is bizarre because this is so off the books of how you deal with it. And I, and I said, ask more questions. And it, and it basically tracked back to someone at another facility, the company, you know, there was a lovesick employee and he, and the, the woman who was the, if you like the center of his attention, uh, reported it. And they said, don't worry if you ignore it, it'll go away. And it didn't. And he ended up killing her and the, and the employer, um, worked at and they lost they lost about four million or something in a civil suit for uh not taking it seriously and so now they had done this study and they'd worked out that every um uh, employee conflict thing was costing them about a hundred thousand dollars so it was it was in their interest to hire private comp security and investigations to look in to find something to get rid of these employees and and so it just got me digging and i work and i found a, a government website i'm sure i would never find it again it was just from uh, spending an afternoon googling that listed all the workplace violence um deaths um by gender and then by job type and it worked out to being pretty consistently something like um uh almost 20 people a week are murdered at work Good Lord. Either by outsiders coming in, 
So if you remember, like the uh, the guy who flew his plane into the IRS building, so that's like an ex external one. But it also includes things like um, somebody who holds up a um, a Seven Eleven and kills like the the cash uh, the the clerk or something mm -hmm. like. So that's in there as well. Um, but it it and it also includes obviously workplace violence from people who are like working from across from you. Uh, in your office, um, and so you just, I just started digging into all these different cases, and um, that were posted on the internet, and watching a lot of court TV for anything that would have anything on that topic. And you usually found that it was usually something small, from you know, bad, you know, a bad joke that gets out of hand, um, something yeah. racial, somebody going through a bad sort of time in their life. And, you know, they're not getting the support from family or whatever, or even people at work who are not going to understand or even know. So it kind of got into that situation. How well do you know the person sitting across from you from work at your job? And, you know, it, it was about relationships and it was just, so I wanted to do something that was just a flare point between, you know, two people that gets progressively larger and larger until it, you know, it becomes, um, something ugly is going to have to happen at the end for it to all stop. Each, each of the things you write is very different from the other things you write. Um, have you ever written a series or thought about writing one? Um, yeah, I did. Um, I write the A.D. Westlake books, which um, is based on my motor racing past. I was inspired by Dick Francis writing about, you know, the darker side of horse racing and all the different aspects of that. And, and from my racing past, I thought, oh, there's an awful lot of weird and strange stuff from that lifestyle that I can bring out. And there's lots of like historical things that I can riff off of for stories there. So I've been writing that. That's more of a, a passion piece um, mm -hmm. on those. But the Zoe, the one that got away, was meant to be a standalone. But because that book has become so big um, and it sold so well, we I am turning it into a series. Um, so Zoe will be returning for several books. Um, so what she gets offered at the end of the book becomes her new life. But I'm the idea that I've dealt wanted to deal with it is I did not want to leave that psychological. Um, issues kind of bent that the one that got away had so each book in the following series will deal with a certain um, psychologically um, fueled storyline so it will be different aspects of um, uh, psychology that I'll be using for it for whether it's hero worship um, victimology kind of issues and things like that that will play out in the books that sounds fantastic. Um, you have had the most interesting life. You started with a career in engineering, went into auto racing, got your pilot's license, and then became a private eye uh, checking for cheaters in gambling casinos. You're, you're practically freaking 007 here. <laughs> um, with all these skills, why did you choose to become a writer? Um, a lot of those careers kind of overlap for different reasons, but um, <laughs> it was just something that was in my head. I think stories were always in my head, but I, like I said, I am dyslexic. I never did very well in school, but tried to avoid the written word pretty much for the first half of my life, which was why I went into engineering, because I wanted to draw. I thought, if I can draw then uh, I don't have to worry about words, but then I forgot about all the specs and standards that I had to work to. Um, but no, I, I moved to the US in 98, and under the weird thought that I would find a job very easily and found that it was very, very hard. Um, so I basically had nothing to do. I didn't, I didn't get any kind of real work for about 18 months. Uh, and during that, that 18 months, I 
I can't remember if my wife had said to me, do something that you've always wanted to do. And because I think in the last year before I moved to the US, I kind of been playing over in my head this idea of um, stories and really not having a clue how to write one. Um, and it kind of spurred out that thing that I have, no, I have, for once in my life, I have nothing to do. I went to college and worked full time. You know, I raced and worked full time and went to college. Um, and for once, I didn't have any commitments of any kind. And so I just kind of explored what it was to try and write. And, and you know, that was 18 years ago now. So um, that's pretty much how I kind of fell into it. So it was pretty much that no one would give me a job. So I had to give myself one. <laughs> yeah. Well, you have quite the imagination. I'm sure a lot of your experiences, obviously auto racing has um, inspired some of your work. Uh, I would think the private detecting also did. Yeah. I, I know my agent still wants me to try and write about, you know, me and my wife sort of exploits, you know, not directly, but certainly a fictionalized kind of version. I do have it in my head what I would like to do. I just don't have it quite fleshed out. It'd be more of a, a, a cozy kind of thing that we did because we did all kinds of things in casinos because they would send us there for three days and you'd have 10 assignments. It oh. just wouldn't be the one. So, and because it was always inter they were always worried about internal theft it wasn't Danny Ocean coming in and ripping them off they mm -hmm. were always concerned about um, you know is, is the guy who checks you in at the hotel are they doing anything shady are dealers doing anything shady are the change makers uh, who wander the floors doing anything shady you know is it um concierge doing it it was always something like that either they were making a stress test their systems or um they had someone in particular you know this bartender is we think is stealing a thousand dollars a night how's he doing it and so you'd have to you know watch that you know it's like this person says that you know, you can bribe your way into clubs or exclusive parts of the hotel or events. And it's like, try and bribe your way into this, uh, into see Celine Dion or something. And so it was those kinds of tasks that we would have. And it wouldn't, and because a lot of the casinos are, are owned by different groups, you'd be bouncing up and down the strip going from New York, New York to Mirage. They want you to do something there where you go over here and do something someone we want someone we want this person to make you an illicit offer um try and make that happen and so it would it'd be silly things like that hmm. well that's very interesting um i'd love to see uh those books when they come out yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh now that there's been an option put on your <clears throat> on your novel is there somebody you can picture playing zoe um you know what? That was one of those things that they asked me. I know they've got some casting people in their head, and I honestly don't really have anybody. Um, we kind of did play with things. I have made a, a few little suggestions, but I think when I'm writing the books, whether it's that one or any, or any of the others, all the characters are me. They're all variations of me. It's like, if I'm in this situation, then, so they've all got my face. It's very John Mal being John Malkovich is that they're all me wandering around. So it's very hard to actually then pin, pin it on someone else. But, um, I, I don't know. I really don't know who I'd pick for Zoe. Um, I think it's easier picking. I think for Marshall, we were kind of talking about, um, Zachary uh, Kinto, who's Spock and and Skyler, uh -huh. uh, Osila, sorry, on uh, on Heroes, um, we talked about possibly I, the guy who's in Mr. Robot. Oh yeah. Um, he he could either play Marshall or even the detective. We said that there was possibility that there was you know I kind of suggested that he could actually go both ways. Uh -huh. is that, 
it would be different for him being a, not being such an unusual character and that he can play someone more heroic and then at the same time he could play someone much darker that would be a good stretch for him um <laughs> yeah so um it was um so they they've been kind of making a few suggestions and i don't know i i i think for me it's finding someone who has who can pull out that kind of character that Zoe had rather than it being someone who's going to be uh, blonde haired and blue eyed. I, I hope I want to be surprised to be honest. Yeah. And it is that thing of like, you know, you, I think I learned quite a while ago, certainly in my early stories, I used to really tie down description really tightly so that when I said, you know, this car is this shade of pink and it's this long and it's this high, everybody's going to see it the same way. And they kind of don't. I kind of learned that when I would say, you know, what do you, th you know, as different books and stories came out, people see the same thing. They add their own um, shapes and colors to mm -hmm. everything. So I tend to not describe things too heavily. So I know Zoe's described as blonde eyed and, uh, uh, sorry, blue eyed and blonde haired. But it was purely because I was creating, for her, I wanted it, to, you wanted to see two sides of the same person. I wanted a, um, uh, an archetype that was going to be destroyed of the all-American girl at the beginning of the story to this sort of like um, very distraught, out-of-control person after the event. Um, but that could be any person who can act that that part who can really make that part convincing that's the bit more important to me but i'm i'm hoping to be surprised by who they can uh, who they can attract to it well i'm sure they'll find somebody good because it's a really great role and uh let's see do you still write horror fiction under the name simon Jan janis i do have some what unfortunately there's so much stuff that's had that's been coming out that's been more thriller based. My horror stuff's kind of um, been pushed onto the sidelines, but I do have um, a horror, a couple of horror novels that are, that just need finishing um, that need coming out. And I have a short story collection that are all uh, road based stories um, that need, that need finishing. So the different aspects of travel on the road, whether it's driving, cycling, you know, pedestrians, gas stations, it's all the aspects of, of you know, road America. Um, and I just need to finish those, but I keep having commitments to other things, so they keep being pushed down, down the road. Mm. Well, it sounds like you're keeping busy. Unfortunately, or fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I know the feeling. Um... Is there anything else you'd like to add before we finish up? No, I think I'm good. And unless you've got any more questions, I just hope that people check out Deceptive Practices and the other books. Um, I hope people like the twisted little ideas <laughs> and um, appreciate how weird what life can be. <laughs> well, I think your twisted little ideas are great and you do a great job of writing stories about them. So Congrats to you on, on all your books, on your latest book and the one that's coming out, you know, the one that just came out, as well as the one that just came out before that. Right. And uh, <laughs> just good job. Well done. And thanks for being on. Um, no worries. Thanks for having me over. Sure thing. Uh, it was my pleasure. Once again, I would like to remind everybody not to forget to check out the Crime Cafe Nine Book Set and Crime Cafe Short Story Anthology, which you can find for sale online at the various uh, buy links at my website, debbymac.com, D-E-B-B-I, mac.com. And uh, that will be it for this week. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed it, please leave a review and subscribe. Talk to you in two weeks.
Thank you.